Now I want you to open your Bibles to Psalm 147. Psalm 147. We'll continue our ongoing Sunday school lesson here. I'm not going to move along here because of time, but Psalm 147. Uh, let's read verses. We got down to verse 9 last week. Let's read the rest of the psalm, verses 10 through 20. He delighteth not in the strength of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion. For he hath strengthened the bars of thy gates. He hath blessed thy children within thee. He maketh peace in thy borders and filleth thee with the finest of the wheat. He sendeth forth his commandment upon earth. His word runneth very swiftly. He giveth snow like wool. He scattereth the hoarfrost like ashes. He casteth forth his ice like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sendeth out his word and melteth them. He causeth his wind to blow and the waters flow. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. For the horse, there in verse 10, we considered his fierceness and his fearlessness, uh, as Job described in Job chapter 39. And God says there, Job 39, Hast thou given the horse his strength? Uh, hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? There in Job 39, 19. And in verse 22 there, we read, He mocketh that fear, and is not affrighted, neither turneth he back from the sword. Uh, a good chorus in a cavalry, just charge right into the enemy, doesn't matter what's coming his way. And yet the same God tells us in Psalm 33, verse 17, A horse is a vain thing for safety, neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. So alongside the power of the omnipotent, a horse signifies very little, or the strength of a horse. Also, verse 10 today, the legs of a man. Those do not impress the Almighty, even if they do impress teenage girls huh, in a basketball game or a track meet. <laughs> they, don't, they don't impress God. The Bible says that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. Isaiah 40, verse 28. So a being that never gets tired uh, won't be impressed by the muscles on the legs of a man's thigh. Uh, you know the thigh is the largest muscle of the human body. And um, it represented a man's strength and a man's authority. That's why back in Genesis 24, Abraham had his servant put his hand under his thigh and swear loyalty to Abraham when he went out searching for a wife for Isaac. But uh, it means very little to God. The next verse tells us what the Lord does take pleasure in. And it's not the leg muscles of a man. Look at verse 11. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. For the word fear, that's a recurring theme in the book of Psalms. Let's run back quickly to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. And... Uh, Verse 11 there, it says, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Go forward to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And Psalm 103. Psalm 103, verse 11. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Look at verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. In verse uh, 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. 
Also, I want you to run to the New Testament. Acts chapter 13. Like I say, I'm going to move along kind of quickly because of time save today. Acts chapter 13. Uh, and begin, begin there at verse 14. <coughs> Acts 13, 14. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up, and beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. If they weren't Jews, men of Israel, then those who feared God would have been Gentiles who attended the worship in the synagogue. <clears throat> the word fear means fear. It doesn't mean the sort of contemporary Christian idea of uh, reverential respect and awesome uh, respect for God, dude. <laughs> the problem today is that there's very little fear of God. There's very little fear of authority. <clears throat> it's getting worse and worse all the time. That's why people will block the police. That's why they'll turn over police cars to celebrate a basketball championship. I'm telling you, if the police were had the handcuffs taken off them, yeah. and they could dispense justice where it needs to be dispensed and distributed, uh, there wouldn't be any more police cars burned and torched and set on fire just because your basketball team won a championship. That's the way they celebrate when they win. I wouldn't want to be around when they lose. Okay, hold on, I just lost my page here. But uh, the word fear means fear, not just some awesome reverence or awesome respect. And like I say, the, the problem today is there's very little respect for authority, either earthly authority, your parental authority, school teachers, um, police department, basketball coach, sports coach, or whoever it may be. Never mind the fear of God, Almighty God. Go, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians 5, and let's start there with verse 9. Verses 9, 10, and 11. Wherefore, we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. He said, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. Do we fear failing God in this life like we should? Do we tremble when we consider where People will go, will go who die without Jesus Christ, the way we ought to. Do we fear the Lord's disappointment with us at the judgment seat of Christ when we were indifferent, we were cowardly, we didn't speak up, we didn't witness to somebody, we didn't make the effort, or we, simply, we were simply lazy and said, well, somebody else will talk to them. Somebody else will witness to him or her. Let somebody else give them a tract. Let somebody else invite them to church. Let somebody else talk to them about spiritual things, try to get on the subject of salvation and their eternal soul. Let somebody else do those things. And uh, in my day job, I hear funeral sermons all week long by different ministers, and it's just sad and pitiful and pathetic how few preachers will talk about the need for every sinner to be born again. They'll eulogize the person that he or she was just about a saint. He did this. She did that. She cared about her family. She was a great cook. She was a great mother. She was a great grandmother. She was a great seamstress. He was a great boss. He was a great football, basketball coach. Uh, he was a great Cub Scout, Boy Scout troop leader. He was a great husband, a great dad. 
He was a great business owner, good to his employees, but they don't get on the subject of Jesus Christ. They think by extolling the goodness and the virtues of the deceased, somehow by association, they went to church, therefore God is some sort of, some, somehow brought into the uh, uh, equation, and uh, that is, uh, equates to their salvation, and it doesn't. A sinner needs to be forgiven. And if you don't remind someone that without Jesus Christ, you're a sinner who's still unforgiven, and you're on your way to hell, whether that's, whether that's a palatable, tasteful to you or not, you're still on your way to hell. You need to be born again. And if you don't get on that subject and at least raise the issue some way, somehow, however, however you can do, then you're failing God. We don't fear of failing the Lord as we ought to. When you consider how, how mighty and uh, omnipotent and almighty the Lord Jesus Christ is, why well, I don't want to be on his bad side. I wouldn't want to become his enemy. The Bible tells us what he's going to do to his enemies when he returns. He'll lay waste, like just tread through their blood till it's soaked on the vesture of his, his thigh and the, up to the horse's bridle. Uh, Revelation 19, Battle of Armageddon. And he'll just plow right through them. But uh, let's read, uh, well, let's consider it here. Um, then in verse 11, those that hope in his mercy, we can make good application of that in the New Testament. Um, go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And notice there verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And also Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Romans 8. And verses 20 to 24. Romans 8, starting at verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption, in the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and prevaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which are the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? I'm living with a hope. But it goes beyond mere empty hope. It, it's expectation by the Lord Jesus Christ that one day my body and your bodies as well are going to be transformed Amen. and made into regenerated form, incorruptible form, immortal form, Invincible form, indestructible form, supernatural form, like this world can never can conceive of. Oh, right now they've got all these movies about DC comics and Marvel comics and superheroes and all that. But all that's fiction. We're reading something that's actually going to take place. You and I are going to be superheroes, if you want to put it that way. And uh, nothing will ever uh, destroy us again. Nothing will ever make us ill again or sick again. No more shedding of tears, no more sickness, no more pain, no more discomforts, no more unpleasantness, no more health problems. Won't that be a wonderful time? Amen. And um, we talk about getting those new bodies. And when you're young and you're healthy, it doesn't really appeal to you quite as much as it does the older you get. When you're 17 years old, uh, you imagine you're going to be healthy forever. When you're, uh, you know, 87 years old, you have a whole different perspective on, on the body. Um, if the rapture took place right now, would it be fair for some people to be limited to a 90-year-old body for eternity and other people to a 16, 17-year-old body for eternity? 
What's fair? What would be fair about that? It wouldn't be fair at all. The thing that unites all believers, whether old, young, male, female, thin, uh, fat, tall, short, you name it. The thing that unites all believers is the promise of the image of Jesus Christ. And every one of us will be transformed to be glorified, to look like his glorified body. Do I know exactly what that appeared as? No, I don't. The Bible sort of gives us some clues and hints as to what Jesus looked like on the earth, but not a lot. And even fewer to describe his glorified form. But what it does tell us is sufficient for us to hope that that's going to be my body someday. That's going to be yours one day. Thank the Lord for that promise. But um, verse 12 puts us back in the millennium. We mentioned last week, verse 12, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion. Verse 13, For he hath strengthened the bars of thy gates. He hath blessed thy children within thee. The children will be Jewish children, born to Jews in the millennium. Thy gates will be the gates mentioned by the prophet Ezekiel. Run right over to Ezekiel chapter 48, real quickly. Ezekiel 48. I'll give you a moment to turn over there. Ezekiel 48. And, well, start there at verse 30. These are the goings out of the city. On the north side, 4,500 measures, and the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel. Three gates northward, one gate for Reuben, one gate of Judah, one gate of Levi. And at the east, 4,500, and three gates, one gate of Joseph, one gate of Benjamin, and one gate of Dan. And at the south side, 4,500 measures, and three gates, one gate of Simeon, one gate of Issachar, one gate of Zebulun. And, uh, and the west side, 4,500, with their three gates, one gate of Gad, one gate of Asher, one gate of Naphtali. It was round about 18,000 measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be, The Lord is there. Christ will be literally on this earth, seated upon a visible, physical, literal, actual throne in Jerusalem, ruling over the world, ruling over the nations. The gates of the city under Ezra and Nehemiah's rebuilding were only typified, uh, really only typified the uh, final restoration under Christ. And then verse 14 in our text says, He make uh, peace in thy borders. And as we mentioned briefly last week, uh, there was no security or peace in Nehemiah's time, nor is there any real peace or security in Jerusalem or Israel today. That's why they, they need a full-time army. That's why they need to enlist uh, civilians in the military service. That's why they need as high-tech um, uh, weaponry as they can, the Iron Dome and every other um, early alert system to protect them because there is no lasting peace in the city of Jerusalem. Funny, Jerusalem means the city of peace, and yet there's never been any lasting peace there. However, that name was given in anticipation of when the Prince of Peace will begin to reign. And he rules there, and over the world by extension. Now let's read verses 15 through 18. He sendeth forth his commandment upon earth. His word runneth very swiftly. He giveth snow like wool. He scattereth the hoarfrost like ashes. He casteth forth his ice like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sendeth out his word and melteth him. He causeth the wind, his wind to blow and the waters flow. These two verses are a bit challenging. Luke 4 verse 3 reads, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Providing food out of nothing uh, is no difficulty for God. Run forward, if you will, to the book of Micah. Micah chapter 14, or rather Micah 7. Micah 7. That's in the Old Testament right after Micah 6. Micah 7. And I'll call your attention to two verses there, verses 14 and 15. 
Micah 7, verses 14 and 15. Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage, which dwell solitarily in the wood, in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old. According to the days of thy coming, out of the land of Egypt will I show unto him marvelous things. God fed Israel in the wilderness, sent manna falling on the ground, sent quails falling on the ground, all the other do would go gather it up. Job 38, verse 22, ask, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of hail? <laughs> Verse 17 tells us he casteth forth his ice like morsels in our text. Literally, like uh, uh, crumbs as a man would toss out breadcrumbs to feed the birds in the park. Deliverance in the tribulation is by God controlling the water and the heat and the cold. Um, for time's sake, we won't turn to him. I'll give you the references, though. Revelation 8, verse 10 Revelation 11, verse 6, Revelation 16, verse 12. So we shouldn't doubt that God will also send food to the Jews out of snow, out of ice, out of frost. How he does that, that's for him to know and me to find out one day. But nevertheless, that's what he says. That's what he seems to indicate. And his word is sent out also it's also likened to snow there in verses 15. He sendeth forth his commandment upon earth, his word runneth very swiftly. And verse 18, he sendeth out his word and melteth them. He causeth his wind to blow and the waters flow. His word is likened unto snow and ice, but it's also likened unto the heat which melts those things. And uh, well, we've got just enough time, I think, Run forward to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth, and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So the word of God is likewise compared to snow, to rainfall, to frost, to hail coming upon the earth, and those things are said to translate into food for the Jew out in the wilderness. Now, if you were to ask me to fully explain that, then I'd have to say I'm, I'm stumped, at least at the moment. I haven't spent enough time studying that. But that seemed to be what the verses indicate. And then verse 19 of our text reveals that God is still concerned with the Jews' survival. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. Uh, you recall that Jacob's name was changed to Israel, meaning a prince with God. So sometimes you see the words Jacob and Israel in the same verse. They are simply comments on each other. Um, one by means of two. It, it's not quite a Hindiatus, which is a, a literary device. One by means of two, but he's restating the same thing in different words. In one phrase, he calls them uh, the seed of Jacob, and in the next phrase, he calls, it, calls them Israel. But he's describing the same Jews. And then verse 20, we'll finish verse, with verse 20. He hath not dealt so with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. And that's very true. No other nation has ever received the kinds of commandment and personal attention uh, that the Jew received from the Lord God. And no other nation was given such clear and unmistakable commands, like the Decalogue. We think of the Ten Commandments, just to begin with. Of course, the rabbis uh, and the chief priests eventually took those Ten Commandments and they stretched them into 614 commandments. Try keeping all that straight. 
the, the thing with um, religions of men is they, they never stop adding on to what they said before. They'll give you some revelation, their religion gets underway, and if it's not very long, they have to add some new revelation, add some new commands, add some new rules, add some new rules of conduct and how to do things, whereas uh, Christ said the whole law could be summed up in one, in, in one sentence. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Those two uh, commandments, he said, on these hang all the law and the prophets. Love God with all your heart and love man as you would love yourself. If you focus on, on those two motivations, you'll end up fulfilling the essence, the, the spirit of all the laws of God. And then he says at the end, praise ye the Lord. We don't, we don't praise the Lord like we ought to. I like it when we sing with joy and enthusiasm. I sometimes wish we had a different acoustics over in the auditorium because the ceiling is high. And we have carpeting on the ground and, and the, the, the people's voices get sort of lost in the, uh, the ethos. <laughs> but, uh, but I like it when we sing in here. We have a tile floor and a lower ceiling and people can really shout out. And I like the kids shouting out when they sing. It gives me a chance to cut loose once in a while as well.